Will you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for how you reach out to each one of us individually and how you seek us out, how you make it, um, you make the way for us to receive you. And we just praise you so much for that. And Father, we uh, have some prayer requests. We pray for Laura as she goes through her difficult situation. We do pray for wisdom and we pray for peace that um, she's making the right decisions and that your will will be done and, and everything will work out well. Father, we pray for Patty Fuller and her family and the loss of her father. Um, we know how difficult this is. And um, Father, we pray for the other families who have recently had losses to their families. Father, we pray for Jennifer. We pray that she will be feeling better and that uh, that her abdominal pain will go away and that it is nothing uh, serious and um, just be with her and help her make uh, wise decisions and, and to heal. Father, we pray for uh, Mary Jane's friend, Marilyn Stork. We thank you that um, they were able to get to the kidney and remove it. Um, and we pray for her continued recovery and that she will uh, do well. Father, we pray for uh, my sister-in-law Janice as well, that she'll continue to recover and that she'll be back to full health soon. And Father, we uh, thank you that Beth was able to have her procedure and we pray that um, she will continue to recover from that and that um, she will uh, also return to full health. Father, be with us tonight. Help us as we study your word and as we share our, um, our thoughts and our hearts and help it to be a blessing to each one of us. And um, thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. And thank you for your son, Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay. So we are on week three of the aroma of christ um that's the anointing week um i will be following up with the fragrance of love and then on march 30th with nicole is where we really start into the beatitudes um we'll talk a little bit about them next week but um we've had a few little changes in our teacher lineup but that's not a big deal um and there's the rest of our quarter. I can't even believe we're already on week three. So uh, we are going to be singing.
So uh, welcome to week three. In the last couple of weeks, we've talked about the transformation that we have in Christ. And then last week, our particular aroma as Christians. And so tonight we're talking about the anointing. Um, and we're talking about anointing for consecration. And she started this uh, this lesson series with asking what anointing meant. And obviously, um, we know from having done the lessons that it's consecration. Consecration, but um, I I started with to pour perfumed oil on someone as a means of conferring a special honor and responsibility on them. And then I added setting them apart. Um, but she starts talking about the um, particular anointing formula, the ingredients that are used in the anointing oil. And there was a lot in that Exodus passage that she had us read. Um, and I wanted to look at that for a minute. Um, first of all, just looking at the ingredients themselves, it was 12 and a half pounds of liquid myrrh. I think I've smelled myrrh once. I don't remember what it smells like. I don't know if anybody can add to that, but, um, and then 12 and a half pounds of cassia. I looked that up and as you see, it says an inner bark of a tropical evergreen tree ground for use as a spice. Um, that particular note where I looked it up in the free dictionary said that that's where we get the bulk of our cinnamon in the United States, go figure. I don't know. And then there was another six and a half pounds of cinnamon, six and a half pounds of aromatic cane and four quarts of olive oil. So um, she mentioned, you know, how wonderful that would smell. And I, I do know how much I love the smell of cinnamon. Um, I don't know about you, but I do think it does smell uh, wonderful and that the rest of this together it, I'm sure that it had to have smelled pretty amazing since it was God's recipe. Um, she talked about how it had to be made by a perfumer and she talked, um, it was called, and I thought it was interesting, you know, going on to learn more about what this all meant. In verse 25, it is called both a sacred anointing oil um, and a holy anointing oil. When I was used, uh, doing this, I was using the old NIV because she had used it. Um, so that reference, I'm not sure what it says in ESV there, but um, in it's the sacred and the holy anointing oil in one verse there. And she points out that it was used to anoint everything in the tabernacle, starting with the Ark of the Covenant and down to the utensils and the basins. And that those items would then be consecrated. They were set apart for holy uh, use for godly purposes. And then she mentioned in verse 29 that these items were so holy at that point that anyone who touches them at that point becomes holy. And then, of course, it was used to anoint Aaron and his sons. Excuse me, and we're going to talk about more of that in a minute. And it was supposed to be used throughout the generations. And it was not to be used on ordinary people. That's specifically stated in verse 32. And then this is a quote. This is verse 33. Whoever compounds any like it or whoever puts any of it on an outsider shall be cut off from his people. And so that's how seriously God took uh, this consecrating or anointing oil. It, how serious... Um, how seriously he took consecrating things and people. And Cassandra, or Cassandra, I don't know how you say her name, uh, Cassandra Martin's word about that um, also show how important it was. She says, something that is consecrated is set apart. It is viewed and treated as special and treasured. It has an identifiable purpose and is connected directly to the person who marks the item as consecrated. That's the part, you know, the whole thing that I, I didn't really think about before I was doing this lesson was the fact that it marks the item as consecrated for uh, directly to that person. Um, so in this case, of course, God. When it is something consecrated by and used for God, it becomes holy and useful for his purposes and will. 
And it makes sense, but I just had never connected it that way before. And as you know, in my classes, feel free to chime in anytime you like. Um, and I, you know, I like participation in comments. But you can see how serious this is. It's we're consecrated for God's purposes and his will. So what does that mean in practical terms? Terms. So what does that mean? In, in what way are we consecrated to God? It means that I have a holy purpose that my life isn't to focus on the ordinary everyday purposes, but mm -hmm. on the holy eternal thing. Yes. Anybody want to add to that? And then of course, adding, you know, what I was just saying, you know, that it's specifically God's purposes and his will. Um, this is her take on this, Martin's. God has always called his children to be a set apart people. We are to look, act, think, react, react, move, walk, and speak differently from the world. We are to reflect his love in such a powerful way that people look at our lives and give praise and glory to God. In a nutshell, we are to look like Jesus in a world that seems more and more to resemble the evil one. And so people should be able to see that we're different. And we'll talk more about that later. But this quote made me think of um, my sister, Leslie. I don't know if, if uh, you know, a lot of you know her. Some of you don't. But anyway, she's a Christian. She is um, how I became a Christian. And um, she was working in the library at OSU many, many years ago, obviously. And, um, you know, somebody came up to her and was talking to her and was asking her what was so different about her. Why was she like she was? And that person could tell just by talking to her that she was different. And I, you know, I don't know if anybody could ever have ever told that about me by just talking to me, but, um, we're, that's, we are supposed to be different. And, um, and that reacting just now hit me as far as that goes, we're supposed to react differently. Um, okay. So then first Peter three verse, uh, 13, 15, sorry, my, that ID number on the stop share is right on the top of my titles there. Um, I put both of these in here because the wording is slightly different in them. And I thought there was more nuanced meaning looking at them both. NIV says, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. And ESV says, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy taking together what what do you think that all means then well we clearly see the christ is lord part um i but the sv adding as holy is interesting obviously none of us would question that jesus is holy but um, I just thought it was interesting that that is mentioned specifically in there. He has been, of course, set apart as well for godly purposes. So, so go ahead. The, I was just going to say, I have a, um, another version of the Bible that I use sometimes, and it's the New Living Translation, um, mm -hmm. which is a little bit more of a like thought for thought translation rather than a word for word translation. But it says, um, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. So I like how they put that yes. in that translation. Yeah, in your hearts, setting apart, they're changing to worship. Yeah, and Lord is your life, mm -hmm. Lord of your life. Mm -hmm. So, 
um, Cassandra Martin asked the question, why is it important to daily set apart Christ as Lord? And then how do we do that? Why is it important to do that daily? I immediately went to the verse, um, and I it up. I don't have the reference. That's really bad. But I immediately went to the verse where it says um, that we are to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Um, every thought, you know. I mean, <laughs> and make it obedient to Christ. I mean, that pretty much that's our whole day. <laughs> you know, everything, every reaction, every thought, every every. Um, action every thing you know take it and make it obedient to christ and that would be you're right that would be daily if you're taking every thought nope um, for us go ahead no go ahead uh, no i was just gonna say i think it means that we are intentional mm -hmm. every day about who we are and, and what our life should be. And it, at first I said it sets our mind on him, but I think it resets our mind on him because, you know, with life and all the things that happen, um, I think it helps us focus if we, if we try to do it daily, um, makes us focus more on him and you know practically speaking you know maybe starting our day with a, a prayer before we even get started on our day and asking for him to help us have that kind of intention in our lives on you know throughout the day yes absolutely i also think um and and this can be bad or it can be good um that if you can make a habit of doing it, um, I know when I get into the habit of doing things, then they actually will get done versus not. And so it shouldn't be a mindless habit. Like Ramona was saying, it needs to be in intentional. But I do think it's, it's good for daily um, to get into the habit of doing something, whether it's Bible study or reading the Bible or praying, you know, habits can be really good mm -hmm. and so i think that daily thing can be a reminder um to always being paying attention and it's a discipline it's it's yeah. it's it's um you know you have to discipline yourself to be that intentional <laughs> and i was thinking along with all of that then that prevents um, Satan from getting a foothold. You don't, you know, we don't want to put down that armor of God, you know, for a day or two or five, you know, you just don't, it's not, um, yeah. Anybody else have oh, anything? Yeah, I do. If you, um, by doing it, by being Christ-like daily, gives you uh -huh. it, it make it makes you so that you can um i don't know how to word this you 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 are more like christ and when somebody does approach you you can talk to them more like christ i don't know if mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah no it does it, it gives your 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 you're coming off to be a believer you are a believer and people people are more prone to talk to you or there will be they'll see this in you and you might you 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 might lead them to christ also mm -hmm. yep. absolutely uh, thinking and speaking differently the verse that i was referencing is second corinthians 10 5 um, and it starts out, it's one of always how Paul does that with, you know, he'll tell you what to get rid of and then what to do. And this one starts out with demolish. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So get rid of that, demolish those things. And we take every captive, every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
So again, just a mindset of being on Christ. Excellent. I think along with that, um, kind of to summarize what everyone is saying is that we're putting self in the background and not focusing on ourselves, but putting the focus on God. Right. And remembering to do that every day is, can be difficult. Yep. That's a lot of, those are a lot of good comments. And um, it's, you know, obviously if we're trying to be more Christ-like, we shouldn't, it should happen every day. We should do all those things to try to focus. Um, she mentions first or second Corinthians. This is on page 38. I didn't put this scripture up, up but in uh, second Corinthians six verses 16 through 18, what does she say is God's specific expectation for his people? We're to be separate different yes um and i think it says specifically doesn't it separate ourselves from evil which i know you're implying <laughs> right and she she goes on to talk about how sinful things should become detestable to us um you know we should be able to be shocked by things that people do and say um it should be detestable and we need to remain pure in an evil world. So um, she makes the point that it's important to remember for what purposes we are to be set apart. And she mentioned second Timothy two verses 20 through 21, which I forgot to change the top part of that. Um, now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use. And here are the purposes set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house and ready for every good week work, uh, ready for every good work. So we're set apart as holy, useful to the master, and ready for every good work. And so we need to remember that we are his and that um, he created us, he consecrated us when we were baptized and it's his place to determine our purposes because we are his. She talked about the three types of anointings in the Old Testament. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them. I will mention them each and uh, talk sum up basically what she said in Exodus 40 verses 12 through 15 that's where Aaron and his sons are consecrated for the priesthood uh, that makes them mediators between God and man they were responsible for offering daily sacrifices and the sacrifice on day of atonement they were responsible for teaching people the law she did mention, and I thought that was interesting, that you know their whole inheritance was their priesthood. Uh, they didn't have a particular land in the promised land, their tribe of Levi, because they were priests and they had another inheritance, a greater one. They belong to God, are marked for his service, and are driven by devotion. That's a quote from Martin. In 1 Chronicles 16.22 and 1 Kings 19.16, that's two examples that talk about prophets being anointed. One of them is just saying that, referring to prophets as anointed. The other one is a specific example. These people are messengers of God, and that it's important to remember that their message is God's word, and their actions are directed by the will of God. And sometimes God is telling what will happen in the future. And we were, I, I know Wendy was talking about our classes on Ahab recently for the, with the children's classes. There is another example here where Ahab wanted Micaiah to prophesy 
good for him. He complained that Micaiah always said bad things were going to happen to Ahab. Or, and Micaiah had mentioned that he could only say what God wanted him to say. And it, that's absolutely right. If you're a prophet, you have to say what God wants you to say. Otherwise, you're a false prophet. Uh, and anyway, it's his message. It's God's message is my point. The, um, the last one is 1 Samuel 16, 13 and 1 Kings 1, 39 are the anointing of David and Solomon for priesthood. And Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20 has always been fascinating to me because it's the admonitions for kings, but it was written 500 years or so before there were kings in Israel. Uh, the verse before... Uh, verse 17 in Deuteronomy 17 is talking about not to multiply wives, which Solomon obviously didn't listen to. But the one she's talking about is that kings were to write a copy for the law themselves. And then they were supposed to read it day by day and live by it. And so that they would learn how to fear God and observe the words of the law. And a couple years ago, um, I overheard a conversation um, between a couple of women who are on class tonight. You can say who you are if you want to. But um, anyway, I overheard this conversation. They were talking about writing out scripture. And I have done it in uh, writing out books. I wouldn't probably write out the Deuteronomy and the law, but um, writing out books of this New Testament primarily are the ones I've done. It's interesting because you notice things that you hadn't noticed before. And um, you do, you can do that so that it becomes rote also, but sometimes we read things so quickly because we've read them before and, and writing them out makes you think more carefully about them. So I do recommend it. Um, anyway, the Kings were supposed to do that and it, it's telling uh, that they needed to do that because it helped them to put them in their hearts. And I'm gonna read uh, Psalm 40 verse eight. I didn't make a slide for it either, but you know what happened with Solomon, um, but David in Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. So he had written it out, and then he wrote it in his heart, and that was the idea for the kings to do. Um, they were supposed to submit to the spiritual leadership of the priests and listen to the messages of the prophets very carefully, unlike Ahab. So the purposes, she goes on to talk about how the purposes of the anointing were twofold, both for setting apart the, their particular individuals for their particular roles, but also so that other people could see the anointed ones in their lives and how they lived them and what, that, what it meant to be set apart in those ways, to be consecrated people. And then the other purpose is to prepare us for Jesus' coming. Now, she does go on, obviously, to talk about Jesus. Whoops, is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jesus as priest and prophet and king. In Acts 10, 37 through 38, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with a Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And I just, I, you know, it's that same thing that she had said in there, you know, she had pointed out that Timothy um, is told by Paul in 2 Timothy about consecrated people. Jesus was set apart as holy, and he was useful to the service of his father and his father's will, just like um, they were supposed to be and we need to be. So how did Jesus fulfill these anointed roles? So how, was, how did Jesus fulfill uh, the role of being a priest? He's a mediator he, he, for us to God. Mm -hmm. Yep. A little tongue tied, and I am gonna shut up. No, you don't need to, you're fine. 
He also, of course, is the atonement for our sins. He offered the sacrifice for our sins. He is the sacrifice and offered the sacrifice. How is um, Jesus a prophet? And she gave verses for these. I've got them listed here, but um, how is Jesus a prophet? Um, I just put down that he represents God to the people. You know, you think about, I don't know if this goes along with the verse that she gave, but, you know, Jesus is the word who became flesh. So we know just like prophets represented God to the people. I mean, Jesus is God, but he shows us what God is really like when he came to earth. Mm -hmm. And his message is obviously consistent with God's, right? He is God. Mm -hmm. She was... That verse is talking about um, how people heard him speak and recognized him as a prophet and praised God as a result. And uh, I, I, you know, the prophets are to bring glory to God. And how is Jesus, of course, a king? How is he anointed as a king? That's an easy question. He's a king of kings, as referenced in Revelation. So he does fulfill all of those roles. She mentions that the very word Christ means anointed one, so that every time we say Jesus Christ, we're proclaiming him as the anointed one. And she goes on to talk about how we've been anointed, and this is uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. I don't know if this came out or popped out at anyone else but me, or maybe it's so obvious it popped, you knew it years ago. I never really thought about how it specifically says that Jesus was anointed with the spirit and, and basically we are too. Um, I don't know, I just think that's very cool. Um, so then how do we fill the anointed roles. So how do we fulfill the role of being a priest? Let me see what page is that am I on here? Where you might have written some of this. There we go. It's on page 42. How did we fulfill the priesthood? Well, we intercede in prayer. Um, Sandy was talking about being the mediator, but we do. We intercede through our prayers for other people with God that makes us priests. We hopefully are teaching people about God. You know, remember the priests were supposed to teach the law uh, to the people. So hopefully we're doing, um, well, that you, you can say the, the law the new covenant and, and all that. Anybody else? Uh, Lynn, I, I thought about it as an anointing, like um, in this time for us uh, through baptism mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit is given to us as a gift from God. And through that, in this verse, it also talks about how we are chosen one Mm -hmm. and giving him the praise and he brought us out from darkness into the light so I mean that's definitely God's gift to us and promise to us and um, mm -hmm. uh, that's what I had on this yeah <laughs> writing well, another thing that I thought of it back to this priest one is that um, we're supposed to be spiritual sacrifices, offer ourselves up as spiritual sacrifices, not to the, you know, not obviously like Christ did, but our mm -hmm. lives are supposed to be a spiritual sacrifice. Yeah. Um, and how are we prophets? When we tell others, when we proclaim the word. 
Yeah, and I, I added that part. She didn't mention the fact that prophets tell what's going to happen in the future sometimes, but we know that um, what's going to happen in the future, uh, some of the things. Uh, so we need to be telling people about those things, right? That Christ is coming again. There will be a judgment day, you know, and, and that heaven is real and hell is real. And so the, we, we do know some things about the future and as prophets, um, we folk, you know, that's something else that we can tell. Obviously, prophets in their truest sense are just telling the word of God. Um, but people today think of prophets as telling the future. So I thought I'd throw that part in there. Um, the king one was uh, the hardest for me, obviously. We're not kings, but how are we um, royalty? Well, the passage... The passage that she gave us there is, is that first Peter right there chapter two, verse <laughs> nine, where we're where we're called the royal priesthood and we're called um, that holy nation. So we're told that we are. Um, the other thing that I just thought of was um, one of the things that I had had pulled out on the part about the kings was um, uh, was that God is saw you know that. Christ is sovereign and a conqueror, you know, um, he's a conquering, conquering um, king. And as, as we overcome, we are more than conquerors, right? Those right. who in Christ Jesus. So I kind of, anyway, that may be stretching a little bit, but. <laughs> well, and we're also royal because, you know, we're uh, sisters of the king, <laughs> daughters, you know, so that makes us royalty. I did like this verse. I thought it was interesting that she asked the, she said this verse and then asked the question, but this verse really does sum it up nicely. The royal part, uh, the priesthood part, the, I highlighted the holy because that's the consecrated setting us apart part. And then the prophet is there in the proclaiming the excellencies of him. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Pretty much sums it up. <laughs> hey, Gretchen, um, I had put the yeah. same thing about that we were conquerors um, trying to conquer Satan um, with God. So that's, I, um, you said that you weren't sure, but um, I put the same thing. There you go. <laughs> I didn't think it was stretching it either. I thought it was fine. <laughs> okay. Um, where was I here on this? Let's see. All right. So then she talks about how there are markers that should help us define our new lives and transform us into the image of Christ. And one of them was rooted in God's power we can't change on our own. Uh, we can't become Christians on our own. We can't anoint ourselves. Um, and then we can't, you know, the transformation, it can't um, happen with us. She referenced uh, second or Philippians 2, verse 13. I did not make a slide, but for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Of course, we did that in another quarter of Philippians, but I think that's interesting. It's not, you know, he's the one that gives us the will and he's the one that does the work in us. Um, she asked the question, and I think it's an excellent question on page 43. Why does having a proper perspective of God's power help you live a consecrated life? So, I mean, in general, you know, how does that help us have a, proper perspective i think because oh. it's possible in my power but all things are possible in god's power mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. yeah good thing good point it, that puts the battle in his hands what did you say it puts the battle in god's hands you know it not that i don't have responsibility obviously but um, you know, he's the one with the power. Mm -hmm. And so I can lean on that and rely on that. Mm -hmm. 
And it should give us confidence to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm writing some of these things down. Good. Confidence. A huge mindset change for me um, happened and as an adult and why this didn't sink in before then, I don't know. Um, but um, I was doing one of Beth Moore's studies on the um, fruit of the spirit. And it was, I think it was even called freedom. And she mentions how that frees you so much when you, when you know it's God's power and his working and, you know, that's the fruit of the spirit. It's not the fruit that Jennifer <laughs> can have. Yeah. It's the fruit mm -hmm. that the spirit of God in me produces. And that is, that's huge. Um, when you realize that, um, it just is a huge mindset shift and such freedom in that I don't have to do that in my power. Um, it is all about God. Yeah, and I, I think it it um, it helps us submit to know, you know, that he is so powerful and that we need to submit and we need to serve him because he is so powerful and, be, you know, and he, he owns us. Anything else? I had the similar thing that he has everything in his hand and control over us. Mm -hmm. I, I had, um, it's about being moldable and we don't get to choose what our mold looks like. He's molding us to what he wants from us. And that's kind of freeing as well. Yep. I like that moldable. Mm -hmm. That soft heart. Yeah. She, she commented on there. Martin did my limited vision can soar because of his wisdom. I like that one too. Anything else on that? Okay. Um, we are sealed as his possession is another one of the markers. The, you know, the, the seal of the spirit is on us. And so our core identity um, has changed. She makes that point. That we belong to God, heart, mind, body and soul and then she has a summation of that this was on page 44 as you see my life belongs to god my heart is his these hands and the talent that fuels them are his own possession we need to be careful what we do with them god loves you and he wants to share his treasures with you and he also wants you to return them with a grateful heart i liked her summary of of that uh, Part of that. The third marker that she talks about is the surety of God's promises. And uh, God has promised us many, many things. She mentioned several of them. A couple of them were that he's going to always be with us. And uh, there's a room prepared for us in his heavenly home. And there are many, many other promises. And I love that second Corinthians verse 120 that all of our promises are yes in Christ. And I find that, you know, just very, very wonderful. Um, so how does knowing that all of our promises are yes in Christ help us in our, our daily consecrated life? That's basically, let's see, what page is that? Um, That sealed his possession, sorry. That's page 45. Um, what is it? Page 45. Um, Thank you. I, I should love have written that in there. <laughs> I love that verse too, because um, his faithfulness and his, you know, he's faithful in his promises. His promises are faithful. And and that to me is, is the reason that I, that I worship God, that I, I follow him and I love him is because of his faithfulness, because there's not a person or thing on this earth that can be faithful like God. And so it's that, you know, that solid anchor, it's that rock you can stand on. It's that, 
you know, all those images you think of, you know, that's like, that's it. That's the glue um, for me anyway. It's okay. Yep. I thought uh, I wrote the hope of eternal life is compelling. The thought of his presence and help in times of trouble gives me hope. Does anybody else have any comments about that? And she talks about and reemphasizes that the spirit is a guarantee that God is going to do what he promised. And this is a quote from her, his surety, his deposit is to give us himself. God gives us himself as a surety and a deposit. Does anybody have any other comments about anything right now? Okay, I knew we were going to come up, you know, short on time to talk about Ruth. I didn't, um, does anybody want to, I, I like how she does that, how she brings in the uh, biblical examples of women and makes these connections. Does anybody want to talk about any of the parallels between Ruth and Boaz and us and Christ? Anything that just really jumped out at you or helps you? I just the really the whole idea of Ruth going to Boaz and just, um, you know, laying herself at his feet and putting herself under his control because she had no other choice. She didn't have any power. She didn't have any power over the situation at all. She didn't know what he was going to do. You know, he could have been very ugly to her and, you know, but she just put herself in his hands because, you know, she knew he was going to be her redeemer and, that, that just really struck me. I guess I hadn't thought about it like that before. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point. Mm -hmm. I never necessarily thought that Boaz had thought all that through ahead of time. I don't, I don't know. Um, I thought that was interesting, but obviously we know that God, Jesus have thought all this through before, um, you know, before Christ gave himself as, and redeemed us. Anything else? Lynn, Lynn? Yeah. Yeah. But Ruth didn't come on her own. Naomi helped her along the way. And I think we need to remember that. That's an excellent point. Yes. Yeah. To taking that further, we need to help other people um, approach Jesus. Is that your point? Yeah. I mean, she didn't do it on her. I mean, she, she came, she came, but she had help to guide her. And sometimes right. we need to look to others to, for guidance. Yes. And no, you're, you're right. Cause Naomi is the one that told her to wash, perfume herself, put on her best clothes. Right. All those things with the parallel with baptism. Mm -hmm. Well, and I did think it was the one that I didn't think about beforehand too, was that Boaz does give her a kind of a, a, a surety a gift as a guarantee you know all that barley I mean I always thought of his generosity and and all of that but it is kind of was an insurance I, assurance that I'm going to do something that you know to to take care of this otherwise he wouldn't have done it you know and and like Lori said he could have been ugly to her and he wasn't so anyway I I hope I don't know if there you have any other comments feel free but I I thought it was interesting to focus on the anointing and I, I, you know, thought it was a good week study.